Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Dr. David Bjorklund. He is a professor of psychology at Florida Atlantic University in the U.S., where he teaches developmental and evolutionary psychology. He served as associate editor of Child Development and is currently serving as editor of the Journal of Experimental Child Psychology. His books include The Origins of Human Nature, Origins of the Social Mind, Why Youth is Not Wasted on the Young, Child and Adolescent Development, and Children's Thinking. His current research interests include children's cognitive development and evolutionary developmental psychology, and those are precisely the topics that we're going to cover up in our interview today. So, Dr. Bjorklund, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Ricardo. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, I've already spoken with a lot of evolutionary psychologists, so I, th I thought it would be great to have someone who does uh, work specifically on uh, evolutionary developmental psychology. So let's start with that. W what would you like to tell us about this field and perhaps the place that it has in evolutionary psychology in general? Because I guess that when we add the developmental aspect to it, that perhaps it has in a way or another to do with, with the, the discussions that biologists had for a, lot, for a long time about perhaps how to include uh, development in the context or in the larger context of biology, right? Right. Well, evolutionary psychology really caught on, I guess, about 30 years ago. And uh, I was always interested in, in evolution, uh, even as a cognitive developmentalist. And I thought I could contribute a little bit to the, to the discussion. Um, Mainstream evolutionary psychology focuses on adults. Uh, the, they're the ones who do the mating and the organization and competition and whatnot, and that makes perfect sense. But to get to adulthood, you've got to go through development. And to me, it's just seemed very obvious that a developmental perspective is, is really uh, uh, going to be central to understanding uh, human evolution or how we become the adults we become. And so about about 30 years ago, I started uh, doing some more reading, doing some more writing, trying to integrate uh, my, my loves of development and evolution. Uh, and I thought I'd write a paper or two about the topic and then be back to studying children's strategies. Uh, but I've kept with it for the past 30 years or so. It's not wasn't quite as easy as uh, one might think. Uh, in part because evolutionists um, although they, mainstream evolutionists, although they certainly recognize the importance of development, it's for them, for the most part, secondary. And for developmentalists, many developmental psychologists view evolution uh, and evolutionary perspective as one implying genetic determinism. If it evolved, if it is based in biology, there's not much we can do about it. And most developmentalists don't really like that approach. And if that's what I thought an evolutionary approach really meant, I wouldn't care for it either. So what I've been trying to do, uh, along with many other colleagues, of course, is trying to integrate development and evolution uh, with the idea that um, we, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, there are many adaptations in infancy and childhood that help us become uh, the adults uh, we do, that to truly understand uh, adulthood, even from an evolutionary perspective, you've got to start with development. And on the other side of the coin, I think this is what you were referring to uh, towards the end, um, what role did development have in the evolution of our species? This is something, the topic of evo-devo that has become very fashionable uh, in biology in the last uh, 20 years or so, about the same time evolutionary psychology has caught on. Um, a lot of the changes, most of the changes that result, that are important for a species are changes in early development that determine and modify uh, the, the, uh, 
the changes that we'll we'll see in in, in the adult form. Right, uh, and I guess that perhaps this is a bit contentious, or at least has been a bit contentious for several decades in biology, uh, when it comes to perhaps the developmental aspects of organisms, because sometimes people associate them with the influences that come from the environment, and perhaps sometimes it gets pretty close to a Lamarckist perspective, or uh, am, I, am I wrong? Oh no, I, I think you're quite right. Um, this is, uh, Lamarck has gotten a bad reputation, uh, probably a bad rap over the years. He was really quite an influential biologist. Uh, his error was thinking that uh, uh, use of an organ during an animal's lifetime can be passed on to uh, its offspring. And this, this just isn't true. <laughs> so Lamarck was wrong about that. Uh, but we're learning a lot more uh, over the past uh, several decades uh, about the role of experience uh, in, in evolution, uh, in development. Uh, so, for example, uh, genes... You know, DNA, this is, this is what evolved, this is what changes over time, gene frequency. But genes are always expressed in a context, and that context, that environment, uh, can influence which genes get expressed, what combinations of genes get expressed, how often they get expressed, etc. And we're learning now uh, about epigenetics, and we've, we've known about epigenetics for a while, but we're also seeing that the effects of, of um, experience on epigen on on genes uh, can uh, uh, is is done through epigenetic markers. We're we're discovering uh, some of the the, the uh, biochemical mechanisms here, uh, and how some of these mechanisms um, can be passed on from one generation to the next through behavior, and uh, setting the stage for um, for organisms selecting niches that can. Uh, alter the, the selective pressures leading to evolutionary changes. So uh, Lamarck might have been wrong in the, in the big picture uh, and, and the details, but in the big picture, the role that experience may play on gene expression and eventually uh, the formation of phenotypes and then eventually the uh, uh, um, modification over, of, of species over time, we're, we seem to be recognizing, if not truly a Lamarckian perspective, um, but an epigenetic perspective that is not inconsistent, I would, I would say, with uh, the main tenets of, um, uh, of the modern synthesis. Mm -hmm. So, since you referred to epigenetics, let, let's talk a little bit about it, because as far as I'm aware, at least at the moment, we have to be a bit careful about how we talk uh, about epigenetics and epigenetic mechanisms and epigenetic effects, at least in humans, because it seems to me that uh, with the literature that we have nowadays, I mean, there aren't, I guess, a lot of uh, epigenetic mechanisms that are definitively proven to exist in humans. Right. Well, if you're talking about uh, epigenetic inheritance, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, the field of epigenetics in, in medicine, for example, is, is really exploding. So we know a lot about epigenetic effects. Uh, we know how early experience can affect the epigenome, so to speak, and, and have consequences uh, years and decades later. Um, what's really controversial are can some of these effects be passed on to the next generation? There's some suggestion that maybe they can in some organisms uh, under some conditions. We don't know how long they'll, they'll last. Uh, the, it's an exciting area, it's exciting time, I think, to, uh, to be an evolutionary biologist or an evolutionary devel uh, developmental psychologist because we're finding some insights into um, uh, sort of biochemical mechanisms uh, for uh, expressing change that, that may have consequences uh, on evolution. But yes, uh, we must be cautious. Uh, particularly in humans, the, the evidence is, um, is not very firm. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it's, uh, the research is exciting and um, 
I, I think in the next uh, next decade or so, we're going to be finding more and more uh, about epigen- about the role of ep- epigenetics in a lot of diseases and a lot of aspects of behavior and maybe uh, in evolution itself. Mm-hmm. So we've been focusing mostly on perhaps the relationship between the biologists and development, but let's now talk a little bit about the other side, because this this boils down to the nature-nurture debate, at least sometimes. And on the other side, we also have the... um, the extreme environmentalists, right? And perhaps until very recently in psychology and through the work of people like, for example, Freud, Skinner, Piaget and others, perhaps we've also been focusing uh, too much on, uh, on the environment and on the effects that at least certain environmental factors might have on human behavior and human psychology, correct? Well, I'm not sure if we've been focusing too much on it. We've just, uh, a lot of people have just been ignoring the biological side. Okay. Uh, you know, assuming you've got a, a human nervous system and then everything else is just uh, environment. Um, and that's a simplis- too simplistic a perspective. Uh, all serious thinkers now, I think, with respect to the nature-nurture perspective, realize we're all interactionists. It's all an interaction of biology and experience. It's how biology and experience interact uh, where really the, the debate continues. And from an evolutionary perspective, evolutionary developmental perspective, we assume that children, babies are not born as blank slates. Uh, we have a rich inheritance that uh, um, the experiences of our ancestors, so to speak, through natural selection have shaped their nervous systems to expect certain types of environments, certain types of stimulation, certain type of events at certain times. And the nervous system develops in line or on time with when these events one can expect to experience some of them. And these, you know, from uh, just a world with gravity and sound and, and light, uh, to uh, a mammal with, born uh, to, a, to a lactating mother, uh, to much more complex social environments uh, in humans. Uh, but you have to have the right experience. Experience really does shape behavior, does, is, is really quite critical to it, uh, but it has to be timed right with, with biological development. And typically, when things go right, which they usually do for, for most members of most species, you get a species typical experience because you have a species typical genome and you get species typical form and function. Um, but when either the genes aren't expressed exactly right uh, or experience is uh, deviates from what is typically experienced by members of the species, different patterns of development can emerge. So uh, development is experience is really very important, but it's experience that is head by uh, an organism with an organized genome. Uh, so it's, it's not um, a random a phenomenon that who knows what kind of experiences you're going to have. Uh, the, um, the, the course of development is relatively predictable in a species typical environment. But there are, of course, individual differences in the genes we have and the experiences we have that make uh, that in, in some sense have been anticipated by natural selection, by evolution, such that uh, a very young organism in particular, young human, but o- other organisms are, are as well, are very sensitive to many environmental contingencies, are aware, so to speak, in an unconscious sense, of course, uh, whether environments are plentiful of resources, are dependable, are predictable. And this will set it on one course of, de- of development that is different when this young organism experiences harshness, unpredictability, for example, which will set it on a different course that that may be adaptive, assuming its later environment is going to be similar to its earlier environment. Right. 
And right at the beginning of your answer, you referred to the interactionist approach that most people, I guess, have nowadays, most scientists, of course. And I guess that perhaps we could talk also a little bit about be the role that behavioral genetics has played o on that part, because I guess that... Uh, with the knowledge that com that comes from that discipline, we really get to look at uh, the importance that both genetics and the environment have, and perhaps uh, the ways by which mm, each of them influences uh, our behavioral traits, also through uh, phenomena like, for example, gene environment correlation, gene environment interactions, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, behavioral genetics is very interesting, and it, you can look at it at a variety of levels. Uh, we have the technology now to identify some genes that we know are associated with uh, certain outcomes or certain biochemical processes and then certain behavioral or cognitive outcomes. And with that knowledge, you can take a look at how at the role of experience. So, for example, one very well well known phenomena uh, are genes associated with um, uh, with with aggression. Uh, that uh, if an animal has one form of the gene, one set of alleles, they are on average more aggressive, more violent in some respects than others. Uh, MAOA uh, genes associated with, with, with this, low levels, I believe. And uh, with a different level, different gene, different allele, less so. But if you look at, at, at research that examines the role of environment, we find this is only true, or especially true, uh, when children grow up in a harsh environment. That when they grow up in a very positive environment, that there seems to be no difference in aggressive behavior, delinquency later on in life, um, between those who have the uh, one allele versus another. The differences are quite substantial in uh, in aversive environments. So we see here this gene environment interaction quite clearly when we can um, get information about specific genes, specific alleles, and also. Uh, at least general information about environments. When we take a look at um, sort of traditional behavioral genetics, looking at, at uh, uh, twin studies and whatnot, and we get uh, estimates of, of uh, the role of how much variance genetic accounts for shared environment, non-shared environment, we can have some insight there as well, but we've got to be careful. Uh, when you find out, when you take a look at the results of research on IQ, for example, uh, most studies find a heritability um, of IQ of about 0.5, that 50%, maybe a little more, of IQ is, uh, is inherited. But those studies are based on some assumptions about the environments. The more homogeneous the environments are of the subjects you're testing, the less influence individual differences in environments will have, the higher genetic influence will be, the higher heritability will be. If you look at individuals with um, uh, from more heterogeneous environments, and then you're going to find uh, different patterns. So these heritability estimates are not um, uh, written in stone. They're relative statistics depending on the population you're studying. And as long as you keep that in mind, uh, these, these kind of re research can be very informative. But there's too many people that I talk to anyway that, that um, assume that these are, are written in stone, uh, biologically based um, characteristics that are immutable. And they're not. Uh, so um, we've got to be a little bit cautious on how we interpret some behavioral uh, genetic data. But, you know, with the right information, they can be, they, they can be very useful. So, if children develop in less aversive environments, the irritability increases, so that means that the innate proclivities that they have tend to, exp uh, to manifest more in less aversive environments, perhaps because there are less environmental obstacles for them to really express their innate uh, tendencies. That's certainly one interpretation. 
A related one is that when you have a sort of high quality environment, there's sort of a threshold. Once you get a, a, a positive environment, a good enough environment, then individual differences in environment won't make that much difference. Uh, and then, as you said, and then your your innate or your inherited characteristics will be more apt to be expressed. And when in, when you're growing up in environments that are less than optimal, then individual differences in environments, how bad they are, so to speak, can have a greater impact. Or so so it, yes, these environments can have greater impact. So the heritability so, for children of IQ for children growing up in, in, in less optimal environments will be lower. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that word, innate, because it seems to me that it's much trickier than it might seem at first sight, at least to most people, because does it really mean uh, when we talk about innate that a particular behavior is present at birth? And, I mean, if it's not present, but is part of normal development, uh, can't we also use the word innate? So, wh what is really the best way to think about uh, innateness of behavior? Well, um, innateness and instinct are words that a lot of developmentalists don't like, and I tend to avoid them when I can, in part because when you use the word, you think you know more about a phenomena than you really do. When you say something is innate, do you mean it's in the genes? Do you mean it's present at birth? Do you mean uh, it's characteristic of the species across all sorts of conditions? Um, and it can mean all those things or none of those things, depending on who's using it. Same thing for instincts. When you say something is innate or it's instinctive, you also sort of think you you've come to the end of explanation. Oh, this is biologic, it's innate. Let's now go to something else. Uh, whereas in reality, there's a lot of go lot going on uh, under the, behind the scenes, so to speak, to produce that kind of behavior. So um, I tend to avoid the use of both terms innate and, and instinct or uh, instinctive, uh, preferring species typical behavior for some behaviors that all members of, members of the species display, at least under most conditions, um, and realizing that when something is um, species typical, when all members of the species display it, or just about all members, it's just about the same sequence, there's still a lot of explaining to do on how it got there. And if you say it's innate, it just cuts off discussion. Uh, then you go on to something else. Then what do you do with that behavior? Which is interesting, maybe important, but um, it doesn't, it makes you think you know more about the phenomena than you actually do. So developmentalists in particular, because we take a look, we are very interested in how things change over time, beginning at conception, um, uh, tend to avoid, uh, many of us anyway, tend to uh, avoid the terms. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, you referred to species-specific species or species-typical behavior, and I guess that perhaps also, uh, particularly in humans, is a bit complicated, because I guess that even by applying evolutionary theory, not only to us, but also to other animals, I mean, it predicts not only that the, the individuals that are part of the same species share uh, a lot of s physical and psychological traits, but there's also variability, b b and, right. it, and it starts with the genes, right? Genes vary uh, among people and among other animals, uh, and that's predicted by, by evolutionary theory. So I guess that perhaps, uh, I mean, w what would be the best way to think about this issue, because I've already had Dr. Lida Cosmides on the show, and it seems to me that the approach that she and Dr. Tubi have to this issue is that they think that we all, as human beings, all the people that exist and ever existed, have sort of the same uh, cognitive or mental adaptations, and when they are exposed to certain types of uh, environmental information, then we have sort of a set of behaviors that we have available to us, and we are made to choose 
between uh, this or that behavior according to the ones that are perhaps optimal in those environmental, ecological, social circumstances? Well, that's reasonable. Uh, it's, uh, but it does take, at least in that presentation, does take the role of development out. And I think that uh, that's an important development needs to be in there, as opposed to thinking that uh, we have a, a single um, human uh, genotype, so to speak, a single human nature uh, with two or three different options depend, you know, for each problem we have depending on it. I think we need to look at, at early experience and how we develop those options. Yes, we're, we are not, um, an evolution perspective does not imply that there is only one, one option, one way of solving a problem. Uh, there's variability, of course, and um, this variability is, is critical. Variability is, is, is the stuff on which natural selection works. It's central to evolutionary explication. So many people who uh, oppose an evolutionary perspective sort of miss that, miss that point. But much of that variability, um, that variability, that plasticity is greatest early on in, in life. And so we, to some extent, develop options. Um, not very specific options necessarily, but general paths uh, to solve particular types of problems. Uh, those problems um, may be solved well with, with these options. They may not be solved well with, with these options. Not everything um, that evolved or every approach we take to a problem, even if it's based on a rich evolutionary history, is, is, is going to be effective. Um, so, you know, in a sense, I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Cosmides' pr perspective, um, but um, need to emphasize, at least from a developmental perspective, that you take a look at how an organism responds to early environments uh, as a good clue to how it may respond to later environments, that its behavior, its cognition is shaped uh, by early experience. And natural selection has evolved, so that is that to be true. Uh, plasticity is an evolved characteristic of Homo sapiens, of all species for that matter, but maybe especially of Homo sapiens, particularly for our cognitive and social cognitive abilities. And when you refer to behavioral plasticity do you, or flexibility, do you mean that uh, when we are exposed to different information that comes from different environments that we tend to uh, develop certain types of behavior or that perhaps we have certain types of cognitive mechanisms or cognitive tools like for example language and things that come from culture that allow for us to really have that, that kind of behavioral flexibility? Well, both. I want it both ways here. There are some mechanisms, many mechanisms, of course, uh, where there is great plasticity early on, but only early on. Language is a good example. Uh, we, our, our system, we evolved uh, to learn language, and we can learn any of the 6,000 current languages spoken on Earth now, plus others that have been spoken and others that may be spoken early on. Um, and Children's acquisition of language is truly amazing to, to watch how, and how such a brief period of time uh, you have uh, children going from making just sounds uh, that, uh, to becoming linguistic geniuses. Um, but we lose that plasticity, uh, that ability to acquire a second and third or fourth language um, uh, as we age. And it's a good thing that we do because we don't want, really want to stay too plastic uh, for an ability such as language or think of sight or hearing our basic senses. These two require plasticity, require response to experiences. Uh, but once these systems are set up, they are so important for survival, we, we don't want them to be continued to be plastic. It may seem wonderful if we could be as plastic and as easily learn uh, a second, third, and fourth language as children do initially, but it's probably not worth the trade-off of dedicating neurons and whole nervous systems uh, to the first uh, the language that we have. With respect to uh, 
plasticity more broadly, learning uh, things about our social and physical environments. Uh, that too, uh, we are most plastic, most pliable early in life. But we tend to maintain more of that plasticity later on, uh, probably more so than other animals. Uh, we never lose the ability uh, to modify our brains uh, and our cognitions of what we know. Uh, it gets lessened. You know, I'm, my brain is not quite as pliable and plastic as it was uh, when I was much younger. I realize that. Uh, but I'm still capable of learning. Uh, you, you can teach old dogs new tricks. Uh, we retain our plasticity. This is a characteristic of youth that we maintain into adulthood, into old adulthood for that matter. Uh, other species do as well, but not to the extent that, that humans do. Uh, we are a youthful species to the extent that our brain plasticity is more characteristic uh, and our brain development is more characteristic uh, of, uh, of our juveniles than it is of the adults of, of other species anyway. Okay, so just going back to the aspect about innate and the innateness of behavior, uh, I mean, would it be fair to call something innate if we have a sort of a set of criteria, like, for example, if it is a human universal and we find it in all cultures or in all studied cultures around the world, and particularly if it occurs in children across cultures, if, for example, when children go through their development, they go through the same or roughly the same stages in terms of acquiring cognitive tools and cognitive capacities, and also if perhaps some of them at least are present in early stages of development and also if we find them in species that are evolutionarily close to us, that is species that in our lineage branched off from it um, er, um, more recently, let's say. I, I mean, if we have... Uh, uh, behaviors that check all of those criteria, do you think it would be fair to say that those behaviors are species typical or innate? Certainly species typical. Okay. Uh, certainly uh, strongly under biological maturational influences. But even something like maturation uh, has gets feedback from the environment. Uh, so, um, I still prefer avoiding the term innate, although what you've described, uh, I can understand people use, using, that, using that term. And this is something that uh, evolutionary psychologists and of course biologists of course look for. We look for commonalities across species. Darwin was one of the first, probably the first, to suggest that mental abilities also evolve. Uh, we look for features in chimpanzees and bonobos, our close genetic relatives, uh, that may be like ours or ours or different from ours. And when we see the similarities and differences, we ask what kind of pressures might have there been on our, our ancestors to modify this kind of uh, the cognition that we have now. Uh, so yes, these are strongly influenced by, uh, by biology. They are strongly species typical. Um, and they are the types of things that a lot of people would be comfortable using the word innate with. I still get just a little shaky when I hear it because I still think it's, it implies more than people really intended to, intended to, to apply, imply. Well, perhaps because then we could at least in some way associate it with a sort of genetic determinism or I, something I like that? I think that's, that's, that's part of it. I think that's part of my discomfort with it, that although if something is to be innate, it doesn't have to be implied genetic determinism, it seems to. And uh, once you, you go down that road, uh, it's sometimes hard to come back. Um, genes are involved in everything, uh, but so is experience. Uh, and experience broadly defined, you know, so the, the chemicals in the cytoplasm of a cell uh, around a nucleus are part of the environment uh, of genes, and so these affect the gene expression. Um, 
so uh, if you if by innate you you do imply genetic determinism, uh, it oversells the, the role of biology. Biology is very important. I mean, as an evolutionist, I've got to think biology is is, is very important. And if anything, I, I, I get criticized for having too much an emphasis on biology uh, and not enough on experience. Um, but it's not an either-or case. We always have to look at the interaction or transaction uh, between biologically-based phenomena and experientially-based phenomena. And that goes down to the level of gene expression. Mm -hmm. But do you agree that we could say that the effects of the environment or the effects that the environment have on a particular organism, in this case humans, uh, have to be understood as biologically mediated in the sense that what occurs at the level of the organism when it is exposed to certain environmental factors, uh, I mean, in terms of the effects that they have, they have to be biologically mediated in a way or another. Like, for example, we have to understand how the organism processes certain types of information and things like that, right? Oh, clearly. Uh, I mean, in one sense, almost everything is biologically mediated. Uh, if we talk about psychology anyway, and that, that it is processed one way or another through our nervous system. Uh, and our nervous system, of course, has gone through a long history of evolution to get, uh, get to the point. But it's also gone through uh, a shorter history of development uh, at whatever point you, you are in, in, in life. Uh, so, uh, you know, in a sense, um, all aspects of human behavior are mediated by biology. Uh, but in another sense, all aspects or most aspects of human psychology anyway are mediated by experience at one level or another. And, and that may seem a bit of a cop-out, you know, you want it both ways. Uh, but that's why I think it's very important to see that you take a look at, at how nature and nurture, biology and experience uh, can interact. Um, and depending on, it, this is also a question of level of analysis. Are you happy with looking at sort of molar behavior uh, uh, or do you need to go into the uh, biochemistry and how far down do you have to go? Eventually you're, you're talking about uh, atoms and, and protons, I suppose. Um, and uh, psychologists tend to have look at a slightly higher level of analysis than biologists typically do, uh, who look at a typical higher level than, than chemists do. Um, but you've got to be, even though we're working on the level of, of, of psychology, of cognition, of emotion, um, of overt behavior, you have to be mindful of the underlying biology. And not not think that it's it, we could just we just can't take it for granted. We don't have to become biologists, and certainly we don't have to become biochemists. Uh, but we have to be mindful of what uh, the biologist and the biochemist uh, can tell us is is possible and is reasonable uh, for understanding the the underlying mechanisms of the things that we as psychologists are really interested in: thought, feelings, uh, emotions, behavior. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, even if children, uh, human children, go through exactly the same developmental stages and acquire the same cognitive competencies, let's say, uh, I mean, they also have to be exposed to certain types of information in critical periods if they yes. are to develop normally, let's say. Correct. And you see this uh, with institutionalized children. Uh, the data coming out now from um, uh, some Eastern European countries who had institutionalized children in the uh, decades ago, the Romania uh, orphanage studies are, are, are some of the, the better ones, uh, looking at how these children can recover from really very deleterious early environments. And timing counts. The earlier they are removed from, from uh, these, these harmful environments, the more likely uh, changes are going to occur. Uh, we see this with cognition. We see this with attachment and emotion. Uh, we're getting, we have data now on, on uh, brain structures and brain uh, uh, neural processing 
so yes, it is truly in their heads, uh, but their brains are, 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 are being greatly influenced uh, by their early experience. And even though young children are more plastic and pliable than older children, for some types of experiences, um, the sensitive period is really quite early. For others, it's, it can be quite extended. Um, but uh, so we see the importance of, of um, basic human or even mammalian type of experiences early in life to produce just your run-of-the-mill typical individual with all the, uh, the, the, the joys and pains that we all have as opposed to an individual uh, who uh, is... Um, cognitively, emotionally, and socially uh, at a great disadvantage and, and may have a very difficult time recovering. And so what is the importance of us as humans having these really long periods of development that perhaps are the longest among all animals that we know about? Uh, what is the importance of that there? Is it for us perhaps because... Uh, we as a, as a species biologically uh, are not really that good in, term, uh, in terms of perhaps having enough tools to deal with the environments that we have to deal with and then we need these longer periods of development to really acquire from other people all the necessary tools uh, to uh, both live in a ultra complex social environment and also deal with other aspects of our ecology and things like that? I think you've hit it on the head. I think that's the most popular perspective. Uh, humans are uh, have the longest pre reproductive period of any mammal. Um, we take a long time to develop. We are extremely dependent for an, uh, an extended period of time. Um, our brains are so big relative to our body size compared to other species anyway, we have to be born early. Uh, there's some estimates that if humans showed the same um, gestational pattern as chimpanzees did, uh, we'd be uh, another year or so uh, before we were born. Um, and so one, in one sense, human babies are essentially fetuses. Uh, born early, and they are getting a whole host of experiences, sensations, uh, postnatally, uh, that other animals just wouldn't get to experience because they're still in, in the utero, in, in, in the womb. Uh, so some people have suggested, some theorists have suggested that this um, uh, fourth trimester, as, as, as some people have, have, have talked about it, really shapes the, the cognition, the emotions. Uh, of humans early on, that infancy is really so important in getting us started here, that making us so different uh, from our simian cousins, because the brain is still developing very rapidly during this time, as it does uh, prenatally for, for all primates. Uh, but even after that, you know, we are weaned, uh, as, as uh, all mammals are eventually, uh, but when most mammals are weaned, they're then officially juveniles, they go out and play, they, they're not quite ready to become adults yet but they can marginally fend for themselves. You can't expect a four and five year old to fend for itself. We're dependent even longer uh, on adult help, helping us to prepare our foods to protect us. And uh, this continues into middle childhood, into early adolescence. And why so long? Wouldn't it make sense if we could be smarter and more competent earlier? Um, it doesn't work that way. And it probably hasn't worked that way uh, because exactly as you said, the, the complexities of human cultures, the complexities of human technologies, we are the tool-using species. Uh, we invent tools, we use tools. Yes, other species do as well, but compared to what humans do, uh, uh, it's, it's really very minimal. Um, to learn to use the artifacts, to learn the social relationships uh, that we're going to need, to learn to cooperate. Cooperation is something that humans do that no other species comes close to, excluding maybe ants and termites <laughs> and bees. Uh, but they're they're a very different evolutionary path that they're on than ours. Um, to master these uh, social and cognitive uh, skills, the argument is uh, it takes a long time, uh, and thus. Uh, 
it, it was quite a risk for our ancestors to spend so much time as pre-reproductives because children die. Uh, the death rate among hunter-gatherers and presumably among our ancestors probably was 50 percent by the time uh, you've got uh, 10, 12 years of age, uh, 25 percent in infancy. Uh, there's a great risk of dying before reproducing. Given that risk, there must be great benefits to extending development, and that those benefits seem to be this very elaborate social and technical brain that we have. My own bias is on the social side. I think uh, uh, we became the the intelligent uh, species and successful species we have because of our social intelligence, our ability to cooperate with 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 one another uh, to achieve things that individuals themselves just couldn't achieve. Yeah, and I guess that this is where we get into how important it is for us as a species to have certain uh, capacities, like, for example, our ability to learn, that is perhaps also the biggest among all the species, our, our ability to imitate, because children from early ages... I, I, uh, as as some people say, they over imitate adults, even in comparison with, like, for example, chimpanzees. That mm -hmm. they don't tend to imitate some redundant steps, uh, right? That, that adults make, and also our uh, uh, developed theory of minds because. Uh, uh, a theory of mind because I, I mean it's really crucial for us to be able to think about what might be going on in other people's minds in order to be able to more or less predict their behavior and also to establish good cooperative relationships with them and then also it, it is crucial the aspect of play in humans because it really allows for us to acquire some of the social and uh, physical skills that we need and particularly that we also need during most of our evolutionary history, correct? I think you've, you've hit it all on the head, the nail on the head there. Um, starting with learning and, and imitation, uh, there are a lot, lots of data out there and, and theories of course uh, as to the human's really propensity to learn, but mainly through social means. Imitation is, is clearly important. Uh, we're not the only social animal. Other animals learn socially as well. Uh, but chimpanzees, for example, seem to do little true imitation, imitating the goal and the, the means to achieve that goal uh, that humans do, and, and we're much better at, at this type of, of learning. And as you mentioned, over-imitation, uh, a chimpanzee in a way is more efficient. He watches uh, an adult or a model do something and there's some irrelevant actions there. They'll just skip those and go to the things that really count to get the reward. That, that only makes sense. Human children don't do that. Human adults don't do that, for that matter. Uh, we tend to assume that the model that we're watching knows what he or she is doing. They're doing it for a reason. Uh, and by certainly three years of age, two-year-olds are a little more like chimpanzees in many respects, but by, certainly by three years of age, uh, we will consistently over-imitate, um, assuming that there's a reason behind uh, uh, these person's actions. Uh, one theory that has a lot of data that I like is, is that reason is probably uh, it's a norm. This is what we do. This is the appropriate behavior. It's important in ritual, uh, but it's important in tool use. I'm assuming this person is using this tool in this way for a reason, how we deal with artifacts. Sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we waste some time and effort uh, imitating things, copying things that we don't really need to. But on average, it, it works well. Uh, it works for our ancestors. It works for children. It works for adults. Uh, we're flexible enough to modify our behavior when uh, something we've imitated uh, turns out not to be necessary. We can eventually learn to over overcome this. But the advantage of over-imitating is that more often than not, we're going to acquire important behaviors. And it's a way of identifying with the model. Uh, it's, a, it's a form of 
social conformity, if you will, uh, which gets back to our social nature, um, which uh, is, again, I think central to what it means to be human. And when you're talking about theory of mind, which develops over the course of, of, of the preschool years, we get better at it, you know, as we get a bit older. Uh, this is also clearly critical to, to um, uh, our social nature, to interacting with others, uh, to realize that what I do is based on what I know and what I want, and what you do is based on what you know and what you want. This gives us some insight into dealing with other other beings. We don't just have to look at their behavior, but we can infer what they're what they're thinking. Um, we can use this. We do use this uh, to cooperate with one another, to teach one another. The role of a teacher has to understand. As a teacher has to understand what his students may or may not know. The student has to understand what the te that the teacher is trying to convey something. Uh, that the, they, the students, don't know to them, um, and uh, this is uh, critical in acquiring um, much of the information, uh, social information that, that humans need to acquire, as well as technical information. But also, as you said, for cooperating with one another, for competing with one another, uh, trying to anticipate what's, what what your move is going to be. Uh, you want that cookie. I want that cookie. How, you know. Uh, what's the best way of achieving my goal um, and uh, we see glimmers of theory of mind in apes maybe in our domesticated animals to some extent in dogs uh, but again not to the extent that we see it uh, in most four and five-year-old children I'd say nothing of older children and adults right right and I guess that perhaps another aspect in humans that is really crucial is the fact that we have this really high developed culture. There are other animals that perhaps also have some uh, incipient forms of culture, but we really have really extended this ability to create culture during our evolution. And so we, we not only inherit genes from our parents, but we also inherit a very a crucial and important information via culture from our tribe or our community or our society. And that's also important. Oh, it's tremendously important. And this is, I guess, almost by definition, there's never been a human species that didn't have culture. Uh, humans are a cultural species. Now, chimpanzees are a cultural species to a certain extent, as, as are orangutans, gorillas, I suppose. If you define culture or maybe traditions as the transmission of non-genetic information across generations, okay. Uh, but humans exceed, ex excel at this, uh, and um, more so than any other, any other species. And it's variability. There's a lot of variability. So it's important for children to understand what people in my group does, what my people do, uh, my family, uh, my community, my culture uh, as, as, uh, at large. And this requires uh, advanced social cognitive uh, abilities. And again, they, they develop uh, over childhood, uh, over uh, early childhood. Children are sensitive to these things from a, from a very early age. Um, so, uh, but human culture gets, gets large. <laughs> uh, it's not just the family. It's not just a clan of uh, 30 or 50 or 60 people. Uh, we've lived that way, presumably, as hunter-gatherers for hundreds of thousands of years until we finally, finally settled down into small farming communities. But we've also evolved the cognitive abilities to deal with people in very large numbers. Uh, and how can we do this? How can we deal with people that we've never met before, that we don't know? How can we know something about them? Well, there are plenty of clues uh, that, 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 that we have. Um, and that is that we share some forms of culture with them. We share a language with them. We share the way we dress with them. We share certain types of greetings with them. Uh, this, is, this was a function of religion. We share religious beliefs. I don't know exactly uh, if you're a good guy or not, if I should trust you or not, but you tithe, you give 10% to your religious organization, you bow down 
to the yeast five times a day as I do. Okay, it's a good sign that maybe uh, we share some. Um, we're able to deal to form very large, complex uh, organizations, if you will, um, in part uh, because we share uh, aspects of culture that we can recognize um, and say, okay, you know, you're you're one of us. I'm one of you. Right. And this is a relatively late developing ability, it seems. Mm -hmm. And I mean, earlier we talked about innateness, but what would you have to say about perhaps us having what some people call implicit knowledge? Like, for example, uh, I've already had on the show Dr. David Sigiri, and we talked about theory of mind and folk biology and folk physics and things like that. So it seems that even if we are not born with uh, explicit knowledge that we are born at least with a sort of implicit knowledge in in the sense that we expect to deal with certain environments and certain aspects of the environment yes i like very much uh david geary's approach to, to to this that we are born as infants or develop very early what he calls skeletal abilities, skeletal prop, uh, properties. These are implicit. They're, they're not available to consciousness. In fact, you could argue that newborns and infants don't really have consciousness, don't have explicit cognition. Um, but these implicit cognitions, these skeletal cognitions, they, they act on the environment or the environment acts on them, and they get more, they get enriched uh, they get more fully developed. They acquire information, if you will. They remain at an implicit level. Uh, we need experience to, to, to flesh them out, of course. Uh, we're not born with these fully formed notions of, of what the uh, physical or social or biological world is like, but with, with, with glimpses of them. Uh, some people call core knowledge. Um, but experience helps us flesh them out, uh, expand them. These still remain implicit, and we do much of our, much of our decision making is based on these implicit types of cognitions um, that have their basis in in biology that that have an early developmental form uh, that gets expanded, fleshed out as as Geary talks about it, uh, you know, through through experience. Um, one of the things that attracted me to evolutionary psychology years ago was that at the core of evolutionary psychology were these cognitive mechanisms, the evolve, evolved cognitive mechanisms, um, and they were implicit in nature. They could become explicit, but they were implicit in nature. Thus, we can use the same types of rules and logic that we use with other species, apply them to humans, but we have these, uh, these implicit cognitions. Um, so, uh, yes, these develop uh, over time as a result of experience. We humans may be the only species or one of a very few species that can make some of these um, cognitions or aspects of them explicit, become consciously aware of them. Um, and uh, a number of theorists have talked about, you know, some kind of central executive mechanism. Uh, Mithen, uh, in, in his book uh, some 20 years ago, sort of, uh, sort of brought, brought this up. Uh, this brings us to the issue of consciousness, of self-awareness, uh, that uh, we may be the only species uh, that can really, is truly self-aware uh, of, of what we think and what we know and can modify our behavior and our cognition as a result of it, um, what has consciousness provided uh, for the species? Is this what makes us the highly social species that we are? I think to some large extent it is. I think you need this self-awareness uh, for elaborate theory of mind, which is why chimps just show very little of it. Um, it doesn't mean those implicit cognitions go away that they are unimportant, they still influence our behaviors, they are the intuitions that we all have, our implicit cognitions, but we have in addition these explicit cognitions, this consciousness, uh, this self-awareness, um, 
that I think is vitally important in our social relationships, social interactions, but also in our non-social uh, thoughts as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I guess that perhaps we have sort of a problem here because we have evolved to deal with certain types of information and certain types of environments and we are born expecting to deal with those kinds of environments we evolved in, but uh, particularly through culture we are also able to create our own environments. The thing is, is that sometimes that can lead to what evolutionary psychologists call evolutionary mismatch and that might be a problem at least sometimes right oh, oh sometimes, sometimes is. is maybe, maybe it, 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 it frequently, frequently is, is. Uh, we, we didn't, didn't evolve to be uh, communicating with people uh, 6,000 uh, miles uh, across a, a large ocean, you know, spontaneously. Uh, uh, but, but we're, we're doing, doing it, and we don't, neither one of us seem really amazed by it. We're, we're, we're functioning quite, quite well. Uh, with it. Um, we, the example is often given, and I think it's a good one, uh, in cultures like Portugal or the U.S., we've got there's plenty of good food around. And uh, we... We can eat uh, lots of it. Uh, we have a sweet tooth. We have this preference for the fatty feel. Uh, and it's, this food is readily available. I can't tell you how many Portuguese pastries I ate when I was on vacation there uh, not too long ago. Uh, but the result is we have poor diets. We, we, we're, we're obese. Uh, at least it's, it's, it's the epidemics of it. Um, but... Uh, these preferences for sweet uh, and fatty foods made a lot of sense for our ancestors who didn't know where the next uh, meal was coming from. Modern culture uh, presents all kinds of problems like this. Formal schooling, children did not evolve to sit in desks in 20 and 30 in a room and listen to some unrelated adult talk to them about who knows what as they fill out uh, pieces of paper. Uh, they evolved to uh, grow up in small groups, interacting with other children in a mixed age group, playing most of their most of the time, and this was adequate for them to acquire the skills that they needed to become successful adults in their culture. Um, it shouldn't be surprising that a lot of children have difficulty in school, have difficulty learning to read, have difficulty with, with mathematics. Um, the context is, is evolutionarily atypical. But because of our big brains, uh, because I think uh, to a large extent of our conscious explicit cognition, our ability to learn, our flexibility, our plasticity, we were able to make modifications to these environments. Um, and um, we don't always do it well. There are pathologies uh, associated with it at times. Uh, we uh, experience uh, great stress. Uh, uh, in dealing with, with many aspects that uh, just wouldn't occur, wouldn't happen in hunter-gatherer cultures. Um, so uh, culture plays a huge role. Uh, culture evolved uh, with our biology. We evolved together. Culture is changing at a much faster rate than our biology is. And we're having, sometimes we have a tough time keeping up. And uh, some individuals have a tougher time keeping up than others. And these are usually individuals without the uh, often uh, social uh, resources uh, that are necessary to make modifications to these species in atypical environments. Yes, and I guess that perhaps even at the level of uh, psychological disorders, let's call them that, uh, it, the, these sorts of environments that we have created, particularly these kinds of uh, industrialized, modernized societies, that sometimes they might also take a toll on people's uh, psych uh, mental uh, elf, let's say, because I mean, even with the rise that we've been seeing in things like depression, I mean, it's not difficult for me at least to imagine, even though it has, of course, a genetic component, that the fact that we live in environments where uh, our communities very easily get uh, fragmented over time because we leave our families and we leave the communities we uh, lived 
in during our early infancy and adolescence and things like that and move to big cities where most people are anonymous and sometimes people also uh, find it difficult to uh, find new friends and to create new acquaintances and things like that. So I, I'm uh, to create new connections, I, I guess that perhaps also some of these problems might stem from the fact that we have sort of developed uh, environments that are much better in some aspects but in others are is a significantly different from our human nature, let's say. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, precisely so. Um, again, in many Western cultures anyway, as you say, we, we leave home, we move to the big cities. Uh, we're seeing this in Eastern cultures as well, where family tends to be a little more typically uh, emphasized. Um, and we're seeing... Uh, uh, problems such as depression and anxiety in part because of it. Um, we're used to, our species was used to growing up with members uh, that they, they were children, they've become adults with, uh, a core group uh, that you uh, you knew well. You could learn, meet new people, of course. I mean, it wasn't uh, that, probably was not that restrictive, um, but it's much more complicated uh, today. Uh, and now we're seeing the effects of social media. In some sense, the social media is solving a problem. So I live far away from my brother. I can give him a call. I can talk to him on Skype. Uh, the fact that we're 1,500 miles away, we can stay in touch. That's nice. That's, that's a benefit. But the way uh, young people in, in the U.S., Europe, and Asia, um, across the world, are using social media now, um, it is often a substitute for face-to-face, person-to-person interaction. Uh, there is a fear that you're going to be missing something. You've got to always be on. Uh, and the result um, of part of the, uh, it is social. That's why we're attracted to it. Uh, but it's artificial social types of relationships um, that we often don't, see ourselves as comparing very well to others we see. People tend to present the, their best selves on social media. Uh, how popular am I? How many likes am I getting? There's, of course, cyberbullying. And we're seeing, um, in the U.S. anyway, and I think this is true in other parts of the world, increased rates of depression and anxiety in particular in teenagers and, and young adults. And we know, you know, it's associated with use of social media. There are even some experiments manipulating social media use and finding uh, changes in um, uh, feelings of anxiety and depression and, and, and stress. So these are uh, humans for the past, oh, I don't know, couple, several millennia anyway, probably, you know, since agriculture, have been living in slightly species atypical environments and coping. Uh, What's happening nowadays is environments are changing much more rapidly. Uh, and a cultural change is occurring at a far more rapid rate than, than biological change could ever keep up. Um, and there are great benefits to it, as you say. There are great benefits to this. Um, but there are costs as well. And one of the things that uh, we as, as, as scientists uh, need to do is try to uncover some of these costs, how we can, and suggest ways of, of how we can minimize them. Mm -hmm. And picking up on that last sentence, just one last question that has to do with the ways we can apply all of this knowledge to education. Because, I mean, we've been referring to children's development and through, through developmental evolutionary psychology, we can know a little bit more how children think, their cognition, uh, the impact that certain things like, for example, example, play, have on their development. So do you think that this knowledge can also be applied to perhaps create better educational environments for children, particularly in modernized societies? Oh, I certainly do. Um, you, you, you mentioned play, the importance of play. 
uh, this is what children are, quote, meant to do. Uh, this is what they evolved doing this, and they learn well through play. Now, will they learn to read? Will they learn algebra through play? Well, maybe, <laughs> to some extent. Uh, but particularly for, for young children, um, preschoolers, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of learning through play, maybe guided play, um, um, as, as some, some theorists have suggested. Uh, may, be a, may be beneficial, a, a good way of, of, of uh, increasing children's adjustment to school and learning. A lot can be learned through play, particularly in a, if it's guided with, in the sense that there are certain things that children must accomplish and learn to be productive members of modern society. Um, trying to push children to learn things in ways that are sort of beyond their current cognitive abilities is probably maladaptive. Yes, maybe you'll achieve some, uh, some gains, but it may be at the cost of high stress and uh, lack of interest in learning in general. Um, once we get to older children, there are a, a lot of variability. So there are people like Peter Gray who have proposed uh, learning environments that are truly free. Uh, that children, you, you have plenty of resources there and you have uh, adults who are willing to provide any knowledge and ask any questions they want, but you let them go at their own pace and interact with other children and they'll acquire the skills that they need much as hunter-gatherers ac acquire the skills that they need. Um, and then there are other perspectives such as, as Dave Geary uh, proposing that uh, there are ways that which we think that, that uh, uh, sort of hamper acquiring important um, uh, pieces of knowledge of modern technology of mathematics or physics, for example. But knowing this, we can sort of work around it and, and help children, um, give children information in ways that are consistent with their um, uh, their ways of ways of thinking. So there's not a single evolutionarily evolution or or evolutionary educational approach. Uh, it's uh, we're not monolithic. There, there are different uh, different ways of, of of thinking about how how we can best use an evolutionary model, evolutionary models to enhance education. Um, but I think these theories have been neglected in the past. I think they have much to offer, uh, and my hope is that evolutionary developmental and educational psychologists uh, will be taken seriously and some of their ideas uh, applied, applied to schools, not just uh, for, for learning, uh, but for reducing things like bullying. Uh, some, some of the problems we have in schools, uh, evolutionary, there are evolutionary approaches that um, are differentially informed about uh, how we might want to decrease bullying than uh, non-evolutionary approaches. Right. And just before we finish, I guess that there's a very important aspect there to refer to or to emphasize. That is the fact that, and that's why I referred to play in my question, that is people nowadays, particularly in Western countries, they seem to be very focused on education in terms of acquiring information that children, when they reach adult, adulthood, can use to become professionals and things like that. But perhaps we are neglecting a little bit too much the side, the social side of things, because I mean, it is also the case that we still live in human societies and when children go up, uh, grow up, they will have to deal with other people. They will have to learn how to interact with them in these circumstances uh, and in this context and the other and how to negotiate with them. And I mean, perhaps people also need to put a bit more emphasis on providing children with more time and more space to to really uh, play with other children and to develop and acquire those social skills that are really crucial for any human to function right oh i i fully agree with that uh again we are a social species um and uh that more than anything else i think def defines who we as humans are and and children need the social interaction. Usually they get it. They get plenty of social interaction. Um, uh, but uh, 
schools in the U.S. anyway have been getting rid of recess, uh, have been getting rid of, of, of free time, uh, filling it with, uh, with maybe extracurriculars or another math class, assuming that they'll get their social interaction somewhere else. And some of that social interaction they're getting uh, after school is in organized uh, activities where, they, where adults tell you what the rules are. Yes, there may be other children you're interacting with, but adults are supervising everything. Um, ch kids need to learn to make their own rules, to interact with others, to settle their own problems. There are going to be problems. You know, you're dealing with other people, you're going to have problems. You've got to solve those problems. That's what we are very good at doing. Uh, but we've got to learn to be good at this. We can't have our parents or our teachers always solving problems for us. Um, so much of what children need to learn to be successful in today's world and tomorrow is, are going to be these social skills. So I agree with you entirely that, uh, that um, more play, more emphasis on social interaction, and maybe a little bit less on acquiring specific cognitive or educational skills might be a good idea. The, I, I tell my, my undergraduate students this that the most important thing they can acquire uh, uh, during their college education is the ability to self-educate. They've got to learn to um, uh, educate themselves because their future is going to be one of continuous learning. Learning a very specific skill, educational skill, technological skill right now may not help you in 10 years from now because technology changes an awful lot. Uh, so being able to, to learn to acquire new information is really uh, going to be very critical. And a lot of that is going to be done in social contexts. A lot of that is going to be how well you get along with other people. You can take advantage of the things other people have to offer and you can offer them. Um, social skills are going to be as important, maybe more so, than technological skills in adapting to the uh, this unknown future that we're all facing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Bjorklund, just before we go, would you like to make reference to any places on the internet that people can go to if they want to get in touch with more of your work? I, I will leave links to your books in the description. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, no, I, I, I don't have a huge presence on the internet. I don't have my own blogs or, or, or whatnot. Uh, <clears throat> Um, I'm working on a new book now that's taking uh, that looks more at the role of uh, development in human evolution, a role that children and the process of development had in human evolution. But I hope it'll be out next year. I think tentatively titled um, "The Children's Crusade: How Children Invented Humanity," and um, I'm hoping that uh, uh, maybe people may find that interesting next year. Mm -hmm. Well, look, it was a great conversation and perhaps when your new book is out, we could do another <laughs> one if you liked it, of course, as well, because I, I, I've been really a big fan of your work. So thank you again a lot for taking the time to be on the show. Again, thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it. I really appreciate uh, being invited. Hi everybody, thank you so much for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics from a variety of fields. So just to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you don't like Patreon, you can also do it via PayPal and Subscribestar. Yeah, all of the links will be in the description box otherwise and if you like what I'm doing please share it leave a like and hit the subscription button I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Yane Eninen, and my first producer, Isar Weber. Thank you for all.